remember that the thesis of this podcast or one of the theses of this podcast, this specific podcast, and I guess this fundamental health podcast in general, is that I don't believe that something that is essential for optimal human life, whether it's LDL, which we know moves around hormonal precursors and uh, has immune roles in the human body, immune functions in the human body, or sunlight, essential for optimal human health, as we'll see in a moment, would also be killing us in and of themselves. I believe there is something missing from those stories, but I don't think it's debatable. I don't think many people would debate me when I say that the mainstream story here is that both of those things, because mainstream Western medicine misses context repeatedly and is guilty of nutritional reductionism ad infinitum, that both of those things are essential for human life, but context matters for both of those things. And I don't believe either of those things are harmful for us in and of themselves. I believe the context which we experience both of those things is the most important factor. What we know about LDL, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, is that essentially no matter what your level of LDL is, either it's 70 milligrams per deciliter or 150 milligrams per deciliter, you can develop atherosclerosis if you are insulin resistant. Hmm, okay. But I thought dose was everything and dose made the poison. Actually, dose doesn't really make the poison if you are metabolically dysfunctional. And the same, I think, could be said of the sun. Essential for optimal human health, probably not the main driver or the only driver of skin cancers. What I think is determining the context of our skin cancer risk is the composition of our cell membranes, which is determined by our diets. This is my fascination as a physician. I don't think Western medicine really focuses on this nearly enough, but the composition of our cell membranes, especially the fatty acid composition of our cell membranes, that is determined by the fatty acid composition of our diets. And again, I'm referring to linoleic acid. So keep all of that in mind as we go through this. This is a great paper that I think gives some commentary about the benefits of vitamin D. It has many references that you can see at the end. The, con, the, title, of the, of the, the title of this study is Sunlight and Vitamin D Necessary for Public Health. I would agree, sunlight and vitamin D are necessary for public health. Um, you'll see here that the authors note that the recommendations uh, essentially, the American Cancer Society advocates slip, slap, slop, and wrap to make sure the skin is covered in clothing or sunscreen to avoid all exposure to the sun between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. The U.S. Surgeon General has issued a call to action focused on reducing ultraviolet light exposure, whether from indoor UV or from the sun. And essentially, the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer recommends avoiding outdoor activities at midday, completely avoiding out outdoor activities at midday, wearing clothing to cover the whole body, daily use of sunscreen on the exposed skin. Okay, now let's talk about the fact that there are many benefits to the sun. So what do we see here? The authors note, these recommendations neglect the fact that we have evolved with physiological adaptations to help protect the skin from the sun when we are mindful of our exposure and do not burn. They neglect the fact that increased sun exposure based on latitude has been associated with protection from several different types of cancer type one diabetes, multiple sclerosis, and other diseases. Let's just let that sink in for a moment. So there are so many fascinating associations between latitude and disease. The authors of, the, uh, the authors of that study note many types of cancer, type one diabetes, which we know is very seasonal as well. This is the autoimmune type of diabetes, multiple sclerosis, and many other diseases, including hypertension, cardiovascular disease. So if we just take that association, the hypothesis that emerges is, the further you live from the equator, the less sun you're getting, and your incidence of these other diseases is higher. Could it be that living closer to the equator allows you to get more sunlight, and that sunlight is essential for, essentially, and that sunlight is essential for programming the immune system or playing some role in those chronic diseases, at least in terms of preventing them in humans? As I mentioned, there's also data on other diseases, hypertension, schizophrenia, seasonal affective disorder, rheumatoid arthritis. The further you go from the equator, the higher your incidence of those diseases. Sunlight probably playing a role in many of those conditions. We know that when the skin is exposed to ultraviolet light, especially UVA spectrum light, there's a release of nitric oxide in the skin and there can be a decrease in the diastolic blood pressure of up to five millimeters of mercury for 30 minutes after exposure to sunlight. Many people are deficient in nitric oxide due to underlying endothelial dysfunction something that I believe is probably due to excess linoleic acid in the diet. We'll touch on that a little later in the podcast. But in short, there are many oxidative products of linoleic acid metabolism that can cause endothelial dysfunction that are connected with excess linoleic acid metabolism. You eat more linoleic acid, there are more oxalams, endothelial dysfunction, improper amounts of nitric oxide, 
impaired vasodilatation, perhaps elevated diastolic blood pressure. But what we know from the cardiovascular disease literature is that a decrease in diastolic blood pressure of five milliliters per mercury is associated with an approximate 34% decrease in cardiovascular disease. One of the arguments that has been advanced with regard to the benefits versus the dangers of the sun is, yes, if more people are in the sun and more people are eating garbage food, presumably, there will be more basal cell and squamous cell cancers. But there will probably be less of many other types of cancers, solid organ cancers, less hypertension, less incidence of cardiovascular disease death, certainly less seasonal affective disorder, perhaps improvements in other diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or even schizophrenia, psychiatric diseases, how much morbidity do those cause? What we know about the non-melanoma skin cancers is that there are 3.5 million cases per year, at least when this article was written, and 2,000 deaths from those cancers. So no deaths are good in any context, but these are not terribly dangerous. Anyone listening to this who's had to have an AK, an actinic keratosis, a squamous cell cancer, or a basal cell removed from their face, arms, legs, or back, or anywhere, knows that it's not a pleasant process, and we want to avoid that if we can. But I think that the other question to consider with regard to the sun is when we are putting on sunscreen, which has its own attendant problems, we are covering up in the sun, are we increasing the incidence of other cancers, other chronic medical diseases that cause more morbidity, more loss of optimal health, more suffering, and more death? Specifically with regard to the other types of cancer and their association with distance from the equator, we know that there are higher rates of colon, breast, pancreas, ovary, brain, kidney, cancers, and the blood cancer multiple myeloma as you move further from the equator. How much loss of life is there from these if this is indeed an association, a causal or mechanistic association with lower levels of sunlight? Could sunlight be protective against these solid organ tumors? What is the morbidity associated with those? Quite high. What we know is this, when your skin is exposed to ultraviolet light, many adaptations happen. As I mentioned earlier, UVA light appears to be connected with increased levels of nitric oxide, which leads to vasodilatation. There are beta endorphins produced in the skin from both UVA and UVB. There is thickening of the stratum corneum, and there is increased melanin in the skin, predominantly from UVB. One of the interesting observations that I've made being here in Costa Rica is that people from all over the world are able to get tan through gradual, non-burning sun exposure. I've had friends here from the UK, friends from Sweden, who many of you may know at baseline are light-skinned who gradually over the course of many morning surf sessions, seven, eight in the morning, when the sun is not super high, will become tan. Even if you are light skinned, you can produce melanin in your skin from ultraviolet light, which is UVB predominantly. It takes time and over the course of that, you do not want to get sunburns. So as an aside, at this point in the podcast, people will sometimes ask me, Paul, I'm quite light skinned. What should I do in the sun? And I say, in general, Go in the sun early in the day or late in the evening. Think about morning sunlight and afternoon sunlight. If you're going in the middle of the day, be careful because until your skin has adapted with increased melanin and thickening of the stratum corneum, you are not going to be handled. You are not going to be able to handle that midday sun. Some people have called this a solar callus, and it's something that I have attained myself. I have Mediterranean ancestry. My last name is Saladino. My family is predominantly from Sicily, or at least the Italian side is. So I get tan pretty easily, but it took time. When I first got to Costa Rica, I was not tan enough. I was coming from Texas and I did get burned. I used a t-shirt in the water and gradually with morning sunlight, usually I surf between six and nine in the morning and then I'll sometimes go out in the evening, I became tan. And now I can go out in Costa Rica in the middle of the day and be fine for a few hours. Again, I could still get burned like most people could. And I'm not trying to do that. I'm not saying that's good for humans, but I'm saying that no matter what your heritage is, unless you have a genetic defect in the production of melanin, which does happen, this is albinism, then you can go into the sun and gradually see an adjustment. Now you can't go too quickly into the deep end of the pool, metaphorically speaking, but you can go gradually tiptoe your way and become tan no matter what your ancestry is. I also find it fascinating. There was a 1903 Nobel prize awarded to Niels Finsen for solar heliotherapy for cutaneous tuberculosis. Once the anti-tuberculosis drugs were developed, this type of therapy fell out of favor, but there were solariums, there were these hospitals throughout the desert Southwest. I went to medical school at the University of Arizona in Tucson, and some of the places I did rotations were hospitals for tuberculosis patients who were put into the sun, and there was some improvement in their disease. Obviously, I think that 
we know that tuberculosis is a problematic microorganism. Weston A. Price commented a lot about tuberculosis and at least observed that those who ate an indigenous diet that was high in nutrients, especially fat soluble nutrients from meat and organs, seemed to do better with this disease. So you can imagine at the turn of the century in the early 1900s, many people were not eating those foods anymore, could not afford them, could not obtain them. So putting them in the sun was a step in the right direction. Putting them into a position where they could eat lots of meat and organs would have been even better. And I think that that possibly would have been uh, helpful for their tuberculosis. I think that some people get bad tuberculosis no matter what their diet is, but there are interesting observations about how humans react to certain disease processes. Again, we're back to context based on the quality of their diet. And my strong belief is that an animal-based diet of organs, meat, fruit, honey, and raw dairy, and now sunlight is the optimal diet for humans. And that is supported by men, much literature looking at the nutrients in those foods and what they do for our body throughout all of the phases of our life.